What a great evening this has been. Thank you to Caltech for organizing and hosting such a fantastic event. Caltech was home to my father for some 38 years, and so it's especially meaningful to pay tribute to him from this stage tonight. There's one more speaker after me, but I thought I would use my time to share a few stories about what it was like growing up as a Feynman. My father had a unique sense of humor. This is a button he liked. <laughs> it reads, if you can't read it, genius is genetically determined. You inherit it from your children. You know, he didn't take himself too seriously. <laughs> Perhaps because he didn't take the universe at face value and was always looking at ways to understand and appreciate the world from different points of view. Omni Magazine once made the assessment that Richard Phillips Feynman was the smartest man in the world. He was born in Queens, New York in 1918 uh, and was the son of a military uniform salesman. His mother was funny, pragmatic, and sharp. She was in my life until I was 13, and I remember her well. His father had no formal scientific training, but taught Richard the scientific method, and my father, in turn, inspired his younger sister, Joan, who we've heard from tonight, to become a physicist, which was not the usual course of events for women in those days. He attended MIT as an undergraduate and received his PhD from Princeton University. He married his childhood sweetheart, Arlene Greenbaum, despite the fact that she was ill with tuberculosis, which at the time was incurable, a death sentence. In 1942, he was asked by the United States government to join the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, and he became a group leader on the atomic bomb project. On the weekends, he would borrow a friend's car and drive to Albuquerque and spend time with Arlene, and he was with her when she died, June 16, 1945. After the war, he became a professor of theoretical physics at Cornell University, and in 1950, he was offered a job at Caltech and spent the remainder of his career here. In 1960, he married my mother, Gwyneth, and in 1962, my brother Carl was born. Hey, Carl, you want to stand up? So this next picture is a picture of baby Carl, <laughs> my mom and my dad, with one of the many awards my dad won. And um, <laughs> this, so, so I know I need to explain this picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> It represents a very um, busy and happy week where he literally won an award the day after my brother was born, and so they decided to set this picture up. I don't think it was his idea, but um, they set it up in the hospital. He won the Nobel Prize in 1965 with Julian Schwinger and Shinichiro Tomonaga for their independent work on quantum electrodynamics. I was born three years later. In 1986, he was again asked to serve his country, this time investigating the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion. When I was very young, we had a lot of games that we played. He had one that I loved called The Grip of Steel, and it required me to wriggle out of um, a frozen embrace of his arms, The Grip of Steel. I remember running downstairs and grabbing a roll of paper towels that I used to replace myself in his still frozen embrace. And he pretended to be completely outfoxed by my clever thinking. And I delighted in his feigned confusion. Another one of my favorite games was where he pretended to be a radio. And I would sit on his lap and twist his nose. And he would make up songs from different radio stations. <laughs> On Sunday mornings, he would often forego um, reading the paper in bed for a wild hour of uh, storytelling and drumming and, and loud music with my brother and me, and sitting um, and swinging on my brother's bed because it was suspended from the ceiling by ropes. I was convinced we were having the best of all possible times. When it was his turn to drive the carpool to elementary school, he would start to go the wrong way, or drive to a different school, or, or even start to drive himself to work. And all the kids would say, no, not that way, Dodo. I know. I can't believe they called him Dodo either. Uh, 
And, uh, and he'd say, oh, all right, uh, is it this way? And he would turn the wrong way again. Uh, and, and we'd say, no, absolutely terrified that we were going to be late. Somehow, we always made it on time. <laughs> Thinking back now, as a parent myself, I don't know how he did that. I couldn't have done half the stuff he did. He loved to cause mischief. When we were at a restaurant and putting our name on a list, he would spell the name B-J-O with a line through it, R-K, and gleefully wait for the name to be called. <laughs> when, when, we, or when we were at a, a restaurant, um, they would, he would order coffee, and when it was brought to the table, he'd say, it's for the children. <laughs> he would pretend to speak Italian at an Italian restaurant and converse with our waiter, much to our dismay. It's funny now, but you know, when you're a teenager, it's, it's pretty embarrassing to have a, a parent who enjoys such public games. <laughs> when he was introduced to someone uh, at a party who spoke a foreign language, he would pretend to be fluent in their native language. <laughs> The amazing thing is that his resolute confidence and full commitment to the prank often fooled them into, into thinking that this gibberish was somehow an unfamiliar regional dialect. And, <laughs> and they would say, what a shame it was. They didn't speak the same version of the language. <laughs> Suffice to say, my father had a unique perspective on life that made his approach to most things unconventional. My mother was fiercely independent and a passionate world traveler. So it's no surprise that I grew up in a family of adventurers. One of our favorite things to do was to take our Dodge van and go camping. We spent a lot of time in California, visited Oregon, and even made it to Canada one summer. We often didn't stay at campgrounds. I know, it's a picture of a campground. But we often didn't stay at campgrounds because the van had room for us to sleep inside, so we didn't have to worry about rain or cold. And with that van, we would put ourselves, go to great lengths to put ourselves in the middle of nowhere. At every fork in the road, we would take the one in the worst condition, the most interesting one. The van was inconspicuous, low key. No, actually, it had Feynman diagrams painted <laughs> all over it. My father loved teaching. In 1972, he won the Orsted Medal, the highest award of American Association of Physics Teachers for his contributions to the teaching of physics. 10 years later, he won uh, an award from the Associated Students of Caltech for excellence in teaching. And in his response to the students, he said he was very pleased to be honored for doing something he so thoroughly enjoyed. Once someone asked him about teaching children based on his experiences with my brother and me, and he was unable to have a definitive answer because our personalities were so different. My brother liked it when my dad made up stories about tiny people who would walk around the house and Carl would have to guess where they were based on the details in the story. It required some imagination because the scale was completely unfamiliar. You know, what was um, trees to these people were, were actually uh, uh, stalks of the carpet. I didn't like these stories. I wanted to hear the ones out of the book over and over again. <laughs> they were close while Carl was growing up, and somewhere during my brother's teenage years, they became more like collaborators than father and son. They would go on long walks and discuss technical ideas. I know, because <laughs> I tagged along sometimes and regretted it. So the next picture is a picture of Carl graduating from MIT following in my father's footsteps. It was one of the deep joys in our father's life to have a son like Carl who spoke his language. To say he was proud of Carl is an understatement. My more grounded interests served me well, as later my parents asked me to help them with reminders of tasks they had to accomplish. When my father realized I was the you know, responsible and reliable sort, he tried to teach me how to do their income taxes. <laughs> I was 12. <laughs> my mother told him to stop torturing me. And I should say, I didn't become the family accountant, but I have enjoyed being the family historian. I've curated three books about my father, and I've really relished the time hearing his voice and laughing at his wit. 
In closing, I'd like to show one picture that, to me, encapsulates how encompassing his love for physics was. I know. It looks like a scrap of paper. Yeah, it is a scrap of paper. It's the um, Time Magazine subscription insert postcard thing. Um, as you can see, it's completely covered by equations. This happened during leisure reading, right? So he's reading along and still thinking about physics. This is how he worked. He covered, covered newspaper margins, and placemats in restaurants, even Kleenex boxes with calculations. I don't think he considered it work because he enjoyed it so much, but I think of my father as a very hard worker. Richard Feynman's legacy will probably always be distilled, reduced to a single word, genius. My hope is that generations from now, at least some people know that in addition to the genius who could peer into the quantum realm, he was also my irrepressible, fun-loving, lovable dad. Happy birthday, Papa. <laughs>